Well, the Vancouver International Film Festival starts September 24th, and it's mostly online this year because of COVID-19, of course, but it still offers 102 feature films, including many premieres, and there actually are some in-cinema events with adaptions for safety, of course. Well, Curtis Wallacechuk is the Associate Director of Programming. Curtis, hello there. Hi, Gloria. We are so happy that the show will go on, even in times of a pandemic. But let's talk about access to the material first off. How can the public see this large amount of material that you're offering this year? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, as with so many arts organizations and just people in general, we got into March and faced a lot of restrictions, a lot of closures, and we tried to move beyond that really quickly and think about the uh, the opportunities were, that were opened up to us. Um, so what's really exciting for us this year is that it's the first year that anyone in the province of British Columbia can access the festival and enjoy our programming, which is very extensive. Uh, and they can do so by going to vif.org, which is our website. Uh, we have uh, designed a new streaming platform called Viv Connect, which will launch on the 24th of September. And, um, People can either buy single access uh, films at $9 per, uh, per purchase, or this is where the, the value comes in. They can uh, access a, an all-inclusive subscription, which is $60, which gets you everything in the festival. $60 for access to 102 films. That's an amazing value. You're absolutely yeah, right. Plus, uh, plus, I mean, on top of that, I think there's 80 or 90 short films. There is an entire selection of uh, VIF talks and panel discussions. Uh, it's You can easily binge on this for, for 14 days. So just how does it work, though? Is there is there an hour that the film, a specific hour that the film is available, or is it just open access, watch whatever you want, whenever you want? The, the talks aside, I mean. Yeah, no, I think that um, the majority of the films, we have a few that are available for smaller windows of time. Um, I think some might only be available for seven days, but I would suggest that 95% uh, of the films will be available on a VOD or on-demand basis uh, from the 24th through the 7th. Um, so people can watch the films when they so choose. Uh, that said, you know, we, we do still have capacity restrictions on the films. So if there are things that excite you, things you want to see right away, please make purchase of a ticket or a pass and see them early because we uh, this is a new frontier for us. I think we, we don't know we don't have no frame of reference and don't know exactly how fast things will sell or um, you know where those subscribers will send their views in the first few days. Well, I know a lot of the appeal for for VIF is actually, and I'm going to say this, even the lineups, you know, the, the lineups, the excitement, the anticipation, the chat afterwards. So you, you've got a new VIF center, but you're not going to be able to fill it to capacity, but there will be some in-person viewings? That's right. We're doing, I think it's 15 films at the, uh, the VIF Center, which will reopen on September 24th for the opening night of the festival uh, with a screening of Monkey Beach by Loretta, Loretta Sarah Todd. And uh, this will see the end of a six-month renovation of about $3 million to the facility. Uh, gives us a second screen, um, which is very exciting for the future when things return to some sense of normalcy. Uh, but for the time being, we will be having capacity cap screenings at the venue, uh, which will get us to a maximum of 50 people. The way it's set up, it won't always be 50, but um, we're screening all the work by Vancouver or BC filmmakers, uh, giving them one in-person screening at least, as well as some of the, uh, the bigger titles, uh, some films that have already played TIFF, like Ammonite and The Father, uh, we'll have the Canadian premiere of Brandon Cronenberg's Possessor, and also very excited to have the 40th anniversary restoration of Dennis Hopper's Out of the Blue, which is perhaps one of the finest films ever shot in Vancouver. Well, is there a particular theme uh, this year? I mean, is, is there a characterization for, for this collection? Oh, it's funny. I was listening to a podcast this morning, uh, a film podcast, where they said, you know, every, every film now is a pandemic film, and you just look for these kind of thematics in there. But um, I think there are a lot of films about, um, you know, where you really key in on the themes of resilience and community. And um, I think you see that in a film like Mon Monkey Beach, which opens the festival, and that plays out in a lot of iterations and in a lot of different ways throughout the, uh, the expansive body of work. And then I think that, um, you know, we also have films that more directly address uh, some of the things going on in the world right now, uh, like a couple looks at, at healthcare systems. Also a film called First Weed by Suzanne Crocker, which looks at uh, food security. And you know, she's a filmmaker who lives in Dawson City and looked at eating only locally 
for an entire year. And I think there's a lot of lessons in a film like that that can be applied to people's lives as they move forward right now. Oh, for sure. Any other of the features that, that you're especially excited about this year? Uh, you know, I, I think it's the completest to me where I get really excited about the films I haven't seen yet. But um, there are, you know, a number of standout works. Um, one that I would cite is uh, Nadia Butterfly by a Quebec filmmaker named Pascal Plant. I think that's a film that's exciting for us because we had the world premiere of his first feature film. This second feature was supposed to play Cannes this year. It was an official selection at Cannes, and of course, Cannes did not happen. And it's actually set at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, at which uh, Pascal went to Tokyo to shoot it. Uh, with actual Canadian Olympic swimmers. It's a swimming film. And of course, the 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics did not happen either. So you have this film that uh, kind of set out to be um, exacting in its verisimilitude and instead becomes this very strange like postcard of a Summer Olympics that never happened. And uh, I think it's like kind of almost a, a perfect snapshot for this year as well in, in that regard. Well, with, with so many films from so many different countries, how do you choose just what to bring to this festival? I think, you know, we are, we're fortunate to have a, a really fantastic programming team, even in a year where we were operating with um, significantly fewer resources than we have in, in past years. Uh, we were able to call on people's fields of expertise and also the unique perspe perspectives they bring to things. Um, you know, we have uh, consultants for our East Asian cinema program that has been a long-standing pillar of the, uh, the festival. And then for Canadian programming, we are excited to have, once again, um, uh, local, uh, sorry, BC-based um, Indigenous animator Amanda Strong work with us on that program. So in addition to some of the uh, the big Indigenous features in the festival this year, we also have a program like Intersecting Voices, which is the showcase of emerging Indigenous work. Well, you've obviously found the silver lining in all of this, Curtis. I wish you well with the festival. I hope it just goes goes great. You've got so much to choose from. Thank you. All right, thank you so much.